Hello and welcome to my independent lecture on true Dhamma or following in the footsteps of the Buddha where I try to show the relationship between science and Buddhism. My name is Florian Lau and I am from the Self-Improvement Hub and I'm going to release this lecture bit by bit for the upcoming weeks. And here's a short overview of the things that I'm going to present in this lecture. First, there will be a short introduction, then there will be a short section about me, about the presenter, and why it might be a good idea to listen to me, or at least <laughs> I want to present the material for you to decide for yourself. Then there will be lots of resources on Sutta Buddhism or early Buddhism, and then a, an overview over the course in its entirety. But let us begin. Well, again, welcome very much. As this is my first lecture, my first independent lecture, that I try to release fully online. Normally I just present lectures and create lectures for a university, but this one is on early Buddhism and Dhamma in general. I will try to do weekly uploads. I will release one lecture every week for as long as it will take to, to finish the lecture. And for those of you who want to practice what the Buddha really taught in the suttas, this might be exactly the lecture for you. I exclusively focus on all the lectures that the Buddha gave and try not to rely at all on newer texts. There are 11 big content chapters, plus this one chapter that is uh, the introduction, and this will probably lead to about 20 or more videos in total, about one or each, but I don't try to just uh, go by that. When I just have a short section remaining, then it might very well be that I uh, film a shorter video or have a longer video in total. And there will be lots of uh, interactive experiments that you can do for yourself to try and understand the, the concepts that have been taught in Buddhism, to get an intuition. There will be all kinds of illustrations and thought experiments and exercises, all to gain insight or to at least gain an intuitive understanding of all the things that have been taught in the suttas. Because it's very difficult for modern people to get into all the ancient texts, they are formulated in a way and for listeners that are not very much like us anymore. So I really try to teach what the Buddha taught or translate what the Buddha taught into a more timely and modern uh, language and into relatable similes. And thus everything uh, might make more sense to you. Also, I try to cover everything in the right order. This is something that I realized that is uh, very difficult when it comes to regular Dhamma talks. They are usually all over the place. They don't have a training order. And I will proceed exactly with a lecture in the order in which things should be practiced. Or let's, let's put it like that, at least for most people. Ob obviously, I cannot optimize uh, something like uh, a lecture. Like, uh, such a static medium for every possible listener. There will be people who do not profit from what I present here, but I really try my best to make it as uh, to, to make it uh, as suitable for a broad uh, audience as possible. Anyway, let us continue. So why is it? Why do I want to, to hold this lecture? And I really want to illustrate this with this picture. Uh, as you can see, the enlightened person is a bit much, uh, is a bit like the person that is lying around here. Uh, the meditator is like that. And there are all kinds of things going on in the background. Fear, hope, fake news, politics, anger, trauma, stress, your, your past karma, loneliness, death, illness, all those things, even depression, boredom, greed, all those things do not have to bother you, which is rather interesting. Most people think that life has to be the way they are living it. But that is not true. All those things, all the suffering that comes through that is indeed optional. We do not think it is because we do not know how to view all those things and how to train the mind to make it like that. But that does not mean it's not possible. It is very possible. The Buddha discovered a way out of all this mess 2,600 years ago and we will try to recreate that if we want to. You obviously need to have a very strong wish for all of this, but then it can work. Anyway, why do I want to do this lecture? First of all, there are many things, many practices, many methods that are nowadays falsely attributed to the Buddha himself. This is true for so many things. When I uh, read uh, quotes from <laughs> supposedly the Buddha, like 99% of them, uh, them have never occurred in the Pali Canon. They have been invented much, much later. So they very likely do not date back to what the Buddha really said. And this is also true for so many methods. Even when it comes to very popular styles of breath meditation, for example, the Buddha pretty much never taught things like that. That does not mean there is no merit to it. But I really want to focus on all those things that the Buddha really taught. Because that 
worked. He was able to spawn a tradition that survived until today, even without missioning, without ev evangelizing people. So he does not, did not try to convert people to his belief. It's only people came to him. And it's still the same today. It's basically one of the only religion, uh, religion that does not try to actively convert people. They only take up those people who want to be converted. So it's a rather different approach. And many methods uh, that we nowadays have are completely misunderstood and people can't really pinpoint to why they are actually working. The Buddha was very clear what was working and what was not working. And we try to reproduce that and try to understand what is it that is working about the methods that we are often practicing. And oftentimes it is also true that there are a lot of conflicts in newer traditions with the original teachings. And many times it happens that people cherry pick from the suttas, from the lectures that the Buddha gave, and ignore any conflict that might exist with other suttas. And uh, this is not a very scientific way to go about things. And I really want to undo many imprecise and mystified explanations to make it more accessible to the critical person nowadays, which is uh, something that is very dear to me. Because I had a very hard time getting into all of this until I realized that it's perfectly logical. It's just that people added so much uh, mythical overhead to it. All the gods and all those things play a very small role when it comes to um, the ancient texts. It was mere, well, the Buddha mainly used gods and such things as examples for how even the gods were subject to impermanence and all those things. He never really uh, made use of them as an explanation for anything like that, like for the beginning of the universe or anything. Which is uh, interesting because hard science like Mars and, and uh, computer science and Buddhism are surprisingly in line. And I really want to offer uh, Dhamma, what the Buddha taught, Dhamma is another word for it, uh, it means nature, the nature of things, to skeptics, to those people who are usually not very inclined to anything that might have a touch of religion. And uh, I really want to find the core of the Dhamma or present what I believe to be or how I understood the core of the Dhamma so that you can actually separate the functional parts from all the fluff, from all the overly specific methods, from the ritualistic stuff. I want to separate the look and feel from the essentials. And the Buddha really was intent on just teaching the essentials of the holy life as he taught it. And all the very specific stuff, or much of the very specific stuff, has been added much later and in much newer traditions of Buddhism. And uh, I really have a very strong personal wish to keep the true Dhamma alive as the Buddha taught it. Because I really believe that it is a very good idea to have a fixed point from which you can learn and create your own methods, create what works for you. It's not a good idea to add errors upon errors upon errors uh, by adding to traditions that might have introduced errors uh, along the way of the millennia. And I don't want to bash other traditions. I want to make that very clear. I just want to point out what's most likely true to the original and without contradiction with the suttas, because it is, at least in my opinion, the best starting point that we have when it comes to what the Buddha actually taught and when it uh, comes to actual liberation or enlightenment or awakening, how the Buddha called it. That is freedom from suffering, freedom from greed, freedom from hatred and freedom from delusion, from misunderstanding your own reality, which is a very worthwhile endeavor if you ask me. But anyway, let us continue. So what are the modern problems that we are typically facing uh, when it comes to newer traditions? Again, I don't want to bash them, I just want to point out what is objectively the case. And the first one that comes to mind is that the Buddha often said, or at least uh, once said very clearly, that his teachings, his Dhamma, should be like an open hand and not like a closed fist. So he is hiding nothing from, uh, from, his, from his followers. He always taught everything that there was. Many other teachers at uh, the Buddha's time, for example, were hiding some teachings for special students or people like that. And that is not the case when it comes to the original teachings. The Buddha never hid anything. In well, newer traditions, people try to work with uh, revelations, for example, <laughs> that the Buddha only reserved for his very special students. But in reality, in the entire Pali Canon, in those texts that can be trusted, that they probably relate back to the Buddha, nothing of that actually occurred. He was every, always very open about it, and most teachings that he gave are very much in line with that principle. Uh, in fact, I never really encountered any sutta that introduced anything new. He was always on point. He was never doing anything that was not beneficial, in my opinion. <laughs> and in addition to all of that, 
uh, to the revelation and secrets and the hiding, there are countless word problems that occur nowadays and words that have multiple meanings, for example. We translate the ancient text uh, of the Buddha, obviously, <laughs> because we can't do otherwise. Most people cannot read the ancient Pali language that the Buddha likely spoke, so they rely heavily on translations. And words from the English or the German language or any language really have other meanings uh, <laughs> in the Pali language as they have in the regular speech. And so there are a lot of misunderstandings. And uh, there are also a lot of contradictions with the uh, Buddha's lectures. That might be the result of wrong translations or of people who did not understand the teachings and thus had a problem. They uh, could not translate accurately the experiences that the Buddha tries to uh, convey when those lectures have been spoken or to those people who they have to have been spoken to. And this is a problem that also occurs in the Bible, for example. People without the experience try to translate and the result is obviously a mess because they don't understand what's actually in there and then you have a problem. <laughs> so you kind of need a big degree of insight to even be a good translator. And uh, overall, the Dhamma, the Buddha's teachings, as he often said, should be good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end. But that is not really true for many teachings nowadays. And that is kind of sad, because it could be. If you practice rightly and do everything in the right order, there shouldn't be such a thing as a dark night of the souls, where you are suffering greatly, or even such uh, views like uh, enlightenment is not really worth it, which are kind of widespread. That's very likely not true and does not represent my experience with uh, the insight that you can have you know, on the Buddhist path at all. It is very much worthwhile. It is getting rid of all your suffering if you are doing it right. But many people meme themselves into believing that they are doing it right, that they did it right, and that the ancient texts are just wrong. Which is a very conceited belief, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> and uh, the entire topic of virtue, for example, is a prime example of all of this. Nothing is, in my opinion, as much misunderstood as virtue. People nowadays have a very Christian view, for example, on the word. It's very heavily overloaded. And thus, we have a problem, because we completely misunderstand it. Everything that is virtue or moral must be wrong. But the Buddha never taught anything like that. He never forced us to follow a dogmatic approach or anything like that. He was always very upright and very direct. Virtue is just emotional non-reactivity. He encouraged us not to act out of greed or hatred. That is pretty much all and not out of delusion. <laughs> so those are the three things that are pretty much virtue. And any person that is virtuous or is perceived as virtuous out there in the world acts accordingly. He is not greedy, he is not hateful, and thus he seems like a holy person. <laughs> well, so this kind of holy or virtuous behavior is just a subset of it. If we are not watching uh, 10 Netflix series a day, then we are already practicing virtue. <laughs> if we are not insulting people or are not getting mad at the barking dog outside, then we are already practicing virtue. And that is a good thing. I at least can't think of anything bad that can come from it. It's not dogmatic. It's not anything like that. And we will have a big chunk of uh, content on that in the upcoming chapters. And then there is a problem that management of suffering and overcoming suffering are greatly confused when it comes to early Buddhism. The Buddha tried to get rid of suffering once and for all so that it does not arise anymore. And this is a concept that is so foreign to many people. They think that they have to get rid of their suffering once it is there. But that is not what the Buddha taught. He taught a way to make sure that suffering does not even arise anymore which is very different from most people's methods out there. If you meditate to get rid of your suffering, then you are, strictly speaking, not doing what the Buddha was uh, teaching. And then there is a, let's call it, problem with the book Visuddhimagga. It uh, has many flaws, in my opinion, or misrepresents the Buddha's teachings in many ways. At least I can point to quite a few contradictions with the ancient texts, where the book flat out misrepresents the Buddha, which is not a good thing. And many modern traditions very much go by that book. And uh, especially the topic of a dependent origination, which might be the central paradigm of, of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, the Buddha even called it, uh, it the teachings that are special to the Buddhas. The one teaching that is special to the Buddhas, that other traditions do not have. The one insight that is the core of everything. That is not how the Buddha taught it. <laughs> it is the core teaching and it is misrepresented. And uh, this is a very big problem in my opinion. And I try to mm, at least give you an idea of how it should be um, interpreted. 
uh, to avoid the worst kinds of misconceptions, which would be very beneficial if you actually are interested in what the Buddha really taught. And he was a very logical thinking person, uh, which is uh, very much in line with my personal interest, as I am a computer scientist, a theoretical computer scientist, and we kind of like logic. <laughs> so I want to make sure that everything that the Buddha said is logical, and it is. It can be checked pretty much if you don't... Uh, if you, if you understand the words he used in the right context, because it's easy to misrepresent them. And then there is another problem with the Visuddhimagga absorption jhanas. The Buddha never taught uh, absorbed states of mind. All the states that he described were very open and wide and uh, mindful, pretty much. So the entire description or the entire idea of concentration, as it is portrayed in the Visuddhimagga, is likely not what the Buddha taught. And then there is the concept of impermanence, which is also absolutely central to the Buddha's teachings. And many, well, let's call it Mahayana traditions, kind of get that type of uh, impermanence wrong. Impermanence is still a good word, and they partially get it right. But uh, in a very important aspect, they apply it wrongly. Again, I do not want to bash those traditions. I just want to point out how the Buddha meant those words, and how the Buddha used those words and how they are currently used and how that can lead to big problems and to unforeseeable results and we don't want those if we are perfectly honest and it sometimes happens uh, that people discover a specific new method as an example and uh, discard everything else and uh, they completely misinterpret the bigger picture many people are teaching the last missing piece of the big puzzle that helped them uh, get to big realizations of insight or anything like that and completely misses the big picture and that is not what the Buddha did. He was a very uh, skilled teacher among the best if not the best of all teachers in my opinion and he never did that. He tried to help all the people and not just teach one very specific method. Whatever he taught was always very general so that many people could profit from it. But anyway, let us continue with the next slide. So what is unique? What does this lecture do different? Uh, first of all, unlike many normal Dhamma talks, I use many visual elements that uh, illustrate some of the very complicated or perplexing ideas, which is not something that is often, uh, often done in Buddhism. I probably use up to 100 figures where I try to explain everything in detail to you in the entire lecture. And I also use many experiments and similes to help you get an intuition or test your understanding to actually feel the insight. Because a lot of the Buddha's teachings is about feeling on an intuitive level, on the level of gut feeling. It's not about intellectually understanding things. You have to actually make an experience out of it. This is the best way you can learn and that's the only way to actually get rid of, suffering, uh, of your suffering. You cannot reason your way out of it. Dhamma, overall, is beyond reasoning. It happens before it. <laughs> Dhamma concerns itself uh, with things that must be there for logic to even work. So you cannot really reason about it. Well, in a limited way you can, but it won't have the same effect. And I also offer many guided meditations or contemplations to help you practice uh, the newly learned content. Those will just be training aids. Don't get me wrong. Methods alone cannot get you to awakening, but they can be a training aid. Methods are just methods. They are not the entire Dhamma. The Dhamma starts with insight, <laughs> and it's very important to keep that in mind. If you only repeatedly practice a mechanical set of instructions, then you are very likely uh, not on your best way to liberation. And you should be very careful and often reflect if there is still difficulty in your practice, and if there is still uh, something challenging going on. If there is, fine. <laughs> if you are just repeating uh, a set of instructions to feel good, then you might reconsider, might have to reconsider if enlightenment is your goal. And I'm also using lots of citations from the source texts with modern explanations. So I try to interpret them for you and show you where the contemporary traditions are often likely not in line with what the Buddha taught. And I have already read all the suttas, <laughs> at least all the ancient suttas out there. So I hopefully very much know what I'm talking about. At least I have checked them for contradictions and can pretty much be, I'm, I'm very confident that everything the Buddha said, at least in those ancient texts, is without internal contradiction. And that is very, that is a very good sign and something that very few things or disciplines can claim for themselves. And I also order all the methods and all the advice into a bigger picture and on a timeline. So this entire lecture works based on a chronological order. We start with the initial stuff that you need to understand everything else and then move on to topics that are more advanced and require prior knowledge. Like I really do that in my lectures at university, for example. I try to presuppose next to nothing. And uh, it is 
the entire lecture is hopefully pragmatic and free of contradictions with the suttas. I put thousands of hours of work into this and I'm very confident in it, but uh, hopefully there really won't be any any errors. I cannot guarantee it <laughs> as I'm also a human and uh, I'm, I'm also improving still in my understanding of the suttas, but the the complete foundation should be as error-free as it can get. And I also try to tell the Buddha's life story to make it a bit more interesting for the readers that are new and not too dry. But let us continue. Now we come to a few core facts about the presenter, about me, and why it might be worthwhile listening to me. Because again, I have no real reputation, for example, on YouTube. And uh, most people try to uh, shortcut and find out the value of a piece of information simply by the reputation. It's a heuristic and I uh, kind of have to borrow a bit of reputation from, for example, my title. I'm a doctor, I'm a PhD at uh, Theoretical Computer Science, I'm Florian Lau from Germany, and I use that <laughs> borrow reputation from my title to hopefully convince you a bit. In the end, you still have to check for yourself. Uh, don't be deluded about that. Just because I have a doctor does not mean that the information I present uh, is right. But still, uh, it gives me some reputation and uh, some people might be more inclined to listen to me because of that, so I don't try to, to hide that fact. And I am a theoretical and sometimes a very practical computer scientist, especially when it comes to Buddhism, I consider that to be very practical. I am also a very dedicated meditator uh, and author, I have released several books, I'm a scientist, and I am also a YouTuber and have created uh, close to 500 videos by now on topics that are very related to Buddhism and Dhamma teachings and meditation and all of that and self-improvement in general. But I pretty much regard uh, self-improvement uh, as a first step towards uh, meditation. So it's basically all content on the same topic. And I'm also creating content on this type of uh, stuff, namely personal growth, meditation and Buddhism. And I really like to and try to apply Buddhists and meditation and science principles and concepts to everyday problems, where it is not just more problem management where you hide your symptoms, for example, or try to uh, replace one bad habit with another. I really try to solve those problems for good, to tackle the root causes and not just some proximate cause or symptom, like many other people do. And in my opinion, that's a very good thing to do. And I also, just to give you an idea of what I do in my free time, I also like rock climbing, lifting weights, for example, which is a very un-Buddhist thing <laughs> in many people's uh, view, but I don't think that is uh, un-Buddhist. It's actually perfectly in line with it, but more on that later. And from time to time, I also like playing video games. I have a very <laughs> video game-esque past even, uh, past even, and it's very hard to get fully rid of that. But anyway, let us continue. Now to my curriculum vitae, <laughs> to uh, all those things that I did in my life. Uh, I'm born in Germany, in, in Lübeck, and I'm still living there because it's a beautiful city, it's a beautiful part of Germany, and I have been growing up in the countryside, so uh, I really love nature, <laughs> and uh, I was a dedicated World of Warcraft elemental shaman <laughs> uh, until uh, 2010 when I stopped playing to get better at, uh, at university. I had my Abitur in 2009, uh, that's, that's a long time ago, it's <laughs> uh, almost longer than I, than I like, uh, and uh, after that I started studying computer science because my peers did, so it was kind of out of peer pressure. It's not all bad. My friends were highly dedicated, were very good at math and very uh, good at computer science, and uh, I followed them in, on that path. And in 2013, I finished my bachelor thesis, in 2016, my master's thesis, and in 2020, I finished my PhD thesis uh, during the pandemic, and I even won a prize for it, uh, for the best PhD thesis at that time. And since then, I'm a postdoctoral scientist, uh, and author of many books, and uh, creator of the Self-Improvement Hub YouTube channel, and I administrate uh, at least two Discord servers, uh, and one of them is a meditation community that is also linked in the channel banner. And if you like to, you can actually join in that community to discuss a few things with us. But keep in mind that it's very much focused on early Buddhism and what the Buddha really taught. I have no mind, uh, I do not mind when other Buddhists join, I can totally discuss with them. But uh, we tend to have a very, uh, let's call it hard stand on it. I don't like contradictions in the teachings and uh, I will point to them <laughs> when I encounter them. When the Buddha said something else numerous times and a newer uh, kind of lecture or newer kind of teaching uh, goes against that, then uh, I don't like that too much because what the Buddha did, at least in my opinion, clearly works. At least it worked for me and for many other people who actually tried. <laughs> and many of the newer teachings do not work, which might be a problem. 
Anyway, let us now come to my meditation experience. So it's nice that I have uh, experience in academia, for example, as it really helps me to structure information. But uh, I also need a lot of experience and a very good understanding of the stuff that I'm about to present, namely meditation and Buddhism. And I started all of this at the age of 27, rather forcefully due to uh, some life events that induced great uh, suffering and great trauma for me. So I started uh, studying Buddhism and uh, got a lot of relief out of it. So all the suffering that I was previously experiencing uh, pretty much vanished, or at least 99% of it, which is a great improvement for me. So I'm no longer a slave to my emotions, and I want to help others do the same. So I have Buddhism experience and meditation, meditation experience of more than half a decade. I have been practicing several hours a day of Buddhist-related practices, like reading or structuring uh, the, the text that I'm, that I'm writing myself. For example, I also created a book on meditation meditation or lectures on meditation or things like that or I'm guiding meditations on, on one of my discord servers and helping people uh, with Buddhism and meditating myself for at least two hours a day trying to stay mindful and all those things. So there's a lot of practice that I'm doing every day. It's uh, pretty much my my main passion by now. <laughs> well, well, passion. And uh, another thing that I did, I have read and understood at least uh, as best as I could pretty much all the core texts of Buddhism that I trust and that many other people who go with the early text trusts. For example, Nanavira Thera, uh, who pretty much revived the original spirit in the West uh, of uh, the Buddha's teaching, suggested that those books here that I display here are trustworthy and everything else is uh, of questionable trustworthiness. But the Majjhima Nikaya, the Diga Nikaya, the Samyutta Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Dhammapada, the Udana, the Itibutaka and the Sutta Nipada are all books that I have read plus some part of the vinyana, uh, the rules of conduct for monks and nuns, and also dozens of other meditation books. By now it's, I don't know, 50 to 100 or <laughs> something like that. And I do at least two hours of formal meditation, well, formal meditation practice each day. I sit in meditation for that long. So that's a lot of stuff I do. It's clearly something that I enjoy doing, and uh, I tend to be very good at those things that I do. And as a computer scientist, uh, I have a certain skill of uh, describing processes and procedures, as computer science is literally the science of processes and procedures. It is the science of how to achieve things step by step, and that is great for teaching. So people who are doing algorithmics, like uh, trying to tell a computer how to do a thing step by step, are very good at teaching things step by step. And I really hope that I can take that knowledge from the uh, computer science that I do at university and apply it here to really help those who are interested in Buddhism to better understand everything. And the Buddha did perfect both teaching and wisdom, and the combination is incredibly rare. And I will try my best to actually help you understand both and teach you all the things so that you can gain wisdom for yourself. But in the end, wisdom has to, gain, has to be gained by yourself. You can only do it yourself, and others can only point the way. But anyway, let us now come to a short section about resources. So what can you do if you want to inform yourself on trustworthy Buddhism when it comes to what the Buddha really taught, what the Buddha really did, at least according to the oldest available texts that are, at least from, from my point of view and from many other great monks' point of view, in line with what the Buddha actually taught and what actually works. So the lecture is uh, based on the following resources. First of all, the book The Life of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Nanamoli. He laid out a great timeline of the Buddha's life and his most important teachings and the milestones in uh, uh, setting in motion the wheel of the teaching, as it is often called. So the, the parts about the Buddha's life that I will present in all the, all the lectures, uh, one piece of it uh, each, each time, will be based on that book. Then there is a big chunk of content from my own book, Meditation, Science and Buddhism Aligned. Then Notes on Dhamma by Nanavira Thera, who I greatly admire for his work on uh, unraveling the misunderstandings when it comes to the one core principle of Buddhism, namely dependent origination, the teaching that is special to the Buddhas. That one book is is a masterpiece, in my opinion. And then there are lots of books and videos from Ajahn uh, Nyanamuli Thero, who is a very dedicated monk uh, and a very and also has a YouTube channel that I will also link, who is doing very good content on, on Dhamma that might be a bit disagreeable to some people. He has an Eastern European style of talking, and I would invite you to not be repelled by that and still give it a give it a look. 
in the end, uh, if you don't like what is presented there, that is your greed and your hatred, for example, your tendency. Don't interpret those words in a too negative way. It's just the tendency to, to like and dislike, and not the words he, he speaks. The Dhamma he speaks is absolutely pure. I have very rarely encountered Dhamma teachings so, so pure and so close to what the Buddha was actually teaching. And then there are also wisdoms and parts from the talks of Ajahn Shah and Tanesaro Bhikkhu and uh, the wisdom from my own meditation teacher. And then there are scattered parts from Ayakema's uh, books and videos and from Bhante Kunaratana Henepola's books. Uh, the latter parts were especially important for me at the beginning for my, uh, of my meditation journey. They have been formulating the Buddha's teachings in a way that greatly inspired me. And uh, again, it's not rare that I <laughs> have some tears of joy when I read uh, texts from Ayakema. Uh, she's a Buddhist nun and she has a way with words, at least uh, in Germany, for example. Some of her teachings are also available in English, but most of it is available in German. And if you need a general knowledge foundation in science and philosophy, you could also try the books, uh, The Science of This World and A New History of Western Philosophy. Especially The Science of This World book is uh, very informative, but also very fun to read. It's from Terry Pratchett, uh, an author that I greatly admire and have read a lot of books, probably all books uh, of the Disc World series in the past, and they are teaching very nice moral principles. So they are overall a very good read, and they really teach the big picture of science. He was a co-author on with Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen, I believe. Uh, I've read the book years ago, so I don't really know anymore. But it's a great entry point to pretty much all things uh, related to the history of Western science, philosophy, and all those things. And A New History of Western Philosophy is also a great book. It's a recommendation of one of my uh, noble Discord friends who are also practicing meditation and who are very much uh, into studying philosophy and all those things. So read it. I'm currently also reading it, but it's a big tome <laughs> like the Nikayas, uh, and it takes some time to read all those. But let us continue. If you really want to start uh, getting serious with practicing early Buddhism, I would suggest you to proceed in the order that I have laid out here. You can deviate from it, obviously, but it's a good... Uh, heuristic nonetheless. I would start with a very general book, as you can't really understand the suttas otherwise. You have to begin somewhere, and it's often a good idea to start with uh, summaries that are in line with what the Buddha taught, but also explain it in modern words. And a very good starting book that is also very inspiring is Being Nobody Going Nowhere, Meditations on the Buddhist Past by the Buddhist nun Ayakema. Second, I would like to recommend my own book that is very much in line with what the Buddha really taught, and tries to explain all the words and all the principles in detail, which is very important in my opinion. Then there is a book, The Life of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Nanamoli, which gives a very good introduction into the timeline it all plays out and gives you the foundations that you need to understand all the suttas. And then you can actually start with reading the very big tomes of, of sutta books. So those are sometimes uh, 2,000 pages each, like the Majjhima Nikaya, Diga Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya, and Samyutta Nikaya. You can also uh, read Notes on Dhamma by Nanavira Terra, but you need a good foundation of lo uh, logical thinking and science to understand what is in there. Then you can continue with the uh, Udana and Itibutaka. Uh, those books, especially the Itibutaka, uh, contains some verses and some uh, stanzas. Uh, and the prosa in Buddhism is very hard to understand without a solid foundation and uh, some insight even. So I would uh, save those for last, even though those are the shortest books. They are the hardest to understand. The Dhammapada and the Sutta Nipata and the Thera, uh, Thera Terigata, for example, are pretty much impossible to understand without a very solid foundation in the suttas. So make very sure that you understand everything before you start re uh, reading the poems and the, and the songs uh, about Buddhism. They are very good and they uh, pertain to the core of the holy life, as the Buddha would put it, but they are very difficult to understand without, um, without a solid foundation and insight. It's pretty much like reading titles or abstracts of papers. You can't understand it like that. It's only helpful if you already know what people are talking about, if you uh, understand it in terms of science. And then in the end, you can also read the Vinyana Pitaka. Those are the rules uh, of uh, conduct for monks and nuns, like the Sutta Vibhanga, the Mahavaga, and the Kulavaga. And I usually go by Bhikkhu Bodhi's numbering scheme, as he has translated the most stuff. So if you want to look up some of the suttas that I have linked, and I have linked a lot of sections from the suttas, then your best chance at finding the suttas yourself is 
is to go and look for Bikubodi's translations. But I have all those uh, books pretty much linked in the description of all the lecture uh, videos. Or I, 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 at least I plan to do so. But anyway, there's also video resources that I want to recommend and you can scan them with your phone. From time to time there will be um, QR codes that you can scan. You can just pause the video and do that. There is for once the Hillside Hermitage uh, channel, which is in my opinion flat out the best resource uh, out there when it comes to early Buddhism. There, but it's, uh, it's a bit unsorted as all the Dhamma talks. There's no real order to everything and it's very difficult to puzzle it all together and it takes a lot of time if you are uh, without any further guidance and I really want to fix it with this kind of lecture where you can really try to find out and figure out the order of the teachings. Then there is Buddha House and Metta Vihara. This is a channel of Ayakema, well he's long dead by now, but there are still recordings of her teachings from 1990 to 1995 uh, available in rather good quality and it's very good Dhamma in my opinion. Then there is uh, 1983 Dukkha, which uh, favors and uh, highlights talks from Ajahn Chah. Uh, some other monk reads them most of the time, but they are still very, very good. And then there is Tanosari Bhikkhu's uh, YouTube channel, where are a few thousand of videos available there uh, that you can listen to, which are also very good in most cases. At least in my opinion. Again, you have to check for yourself. It's not good if you just go by hearsay. <laughs> but let us continue. Now I will give you a short overview over the course uh, that is uh, that you might uh, want to listen to over the next few weeks. Again, one video every week. Uh, but first, a few prerequisites. So the first thing that you should bring with you if you want to profit optimally from uh, this uh, lecture is the ability for logical thinking and reasoning. Without it, it is rather impossible to make good progress, at least in the old contemplative style of Buddhism. It is really about understanding things. It's not some magical or mythical experience that is handed to you. It really is an understanding. It's not too dif different from understanding how to add numbers, only that it sets you free from, from all suffering, which is a rather big deal. Then there is the necessity for patience and some delay of disbelief. There are mythical elements in the Pali Canon, for example. It is a good idea to just put those aside for now and focus on the other things because 95% of all the teachings in there can be checked and the rest won't be as far-fetched anymore once you have understood the rest. So just put them aside for now. This is the right thing to do if you want to understand those things and uh, have a hard time accepting some of the mystical elements like some deities and rebirth belief and those things. If you create an artificial hindrance out of them for you, then that's not so beneficial. All the other things are very much in line. It's not necessary to believe in those things if you want to attain uh, awakening or full liberation from suffering. But again, it can be helpful for many people. And then there is obviously the willingness to invest some effort or even a lot of effort. If you want liberation, it pretty much has to be your number one goal in life. So if you, I think Ajahn Shah said that once, if you let go a little bit, you gain a little bit of peace. If you let go a lot, you gain a lot of peace. And if you let go ultimately you will gain ultimate peace so it's all a matter of your own effort but you don't have to do all of that now you can just gradually increase your effort until it feels right to proceed it's not necessary to do all those things at once but then you also need intellectual self-honesty because you have a lot of ideas about buddhism and preconceived notions about buddhism and a lot of words that are not in line with how the buddha actually taught it and uh, as humans we have a nasty tendency to uh, read over certain passages thinking that we understand even though that we have no idea what the Buddha was really teaching. When the Buddha, for example, said or used the word feeling, it's not what we normally think about. <laughs> it's not emotions or rage or lust or anything like that. It's a very speci a specific kind, but we will get to all of that. But I invite you to be self-critical and reflexive. And then there is the urge to find truth. If you have no real incentive to study Buddhism, then you will likely not do it. So uh, you should make sure that you have an honest interest in it and then you can actually progress on the Buddhist path. And you kind of need to postpone your mind of fault finding. There will be things that will sound perplexing to you and uh, you, should act, you should postpone that and put that fault finding mentality to the side as it can be a rather big hindrance. If you do not understand something, it's a good idea to think that you have not understood it fully and not that the Buddha was wrong. And then there is the ability to stomach criticism or self-criticism. Many of the things that I'm going to present here will not be too agreeable 
because the Dhamma goes against the worldly stream. And the worldly stream is very much in, in line with sensual pleasures. And at times I will tell you that sensual pleasures won't be as good as you might think. And that will be very disagreeable to you. But that does not mean that it's wrong. The truth value is unrelated to how something that I say feels. And you have been, very likely, living with the grain of sensuality and with the grain of the world for all your life. So when something goes against that grain, when something questions it or someone questions it, that will not be very uh, inviting or very, very pleasant. So please bear with me in those situations. And in most cases, it's probably also necessary that you had a strong experience of inevitable suffering in life, like a loved one dying like a severe illness or something like that. This is typically what most people need to get going on the Buddhist path. But there are exceptions, very rare exceptions, but I know one or two people who did not need that and still started. So <laughs> it is possible. And again, I try to presuppose next to nothing so you can actually progress on all of this uh, very well without having to uh, know a lot in advance, which is very rare in my opinion. But anyway, let us now come to the syllabus, to the structure of, of the lecture. I would like to begin with uh, the, the chapter on Buddhism and science and show all the relationships and how science actually acts in line with Buddhism. Then I will give you a short motivation and introduction to all the benefits that uh, are necessary or that come with practicing meditation. And there are a lot of them. And uh, many of them are not even related to, to suffering. Meditation has tons of benefits. Then I will show you the historic setting and a chapter on why people actually start. Then I will present the mundane right view, which was very important, and is the mindset and the logical thinking that is necessary to actually progress on the Buddhist path. And then there is a chapter on virtue, which is one of the most misunderstood topics out there. And I will really try my best to convince you that what the Buddha meant by virtue is actually a very pragmatic thing and pretty much beneficial in every way for everyone no matter if you want to attain liberation or just be successful and happy in life. And then there is the most important chapter on wisdom and stream entry. Stream entry is the first stage of awakening and a point of no turning back. When you attain stream entry, then you know what you must do to finish the job, to reach final nirvana. And it's one of the most misunderstood things out there. There are so many myths about stream entry that I will try to... Uh, uh, dismantle uh, during the course of the lecture. And then there is a chapter 7 about samadhi and jhana or concentration, which is what many people try to attain, but you need a lot of preconditions to get there. So by chapter 7 you have all the preconditions to actually practice it, hopefully, at least you have the intellectual knowledge. And then chapter 8 is about uh, the part of the practice from stream entry to full liberation, to complete freedom from suffering, to the best and most sublime experience of happiness that is attainable by humans. And then chapter 9 is about formal meditation methods and about contemplations that you can do in everyday life to actually have something in your hand to uh, tackle the insurmountable seeming task of meditation. And then there is a last chapter, chapter 10. It's about a summary and a lot of personal experiences and all the things uh, uh, on one well, in a very condensed fashion to remind you of what is important and what uh, might be put to the side. And the lecture structure, each lecture, le lecture structure is as follows. We begin with a short recap of the last thing we did in the last week, so it's uh, fresh in our mind. Then there will be an overview, as we're, it was in this section, uh, lecture. Then there are optional five minutes of non-reactivity or mindfulness. Then there's a lot of content, a bit of story time, a lot of content, some experiments, illustrations, uh, similes and all those things. Then a summary, and in the end there is a meditation or contemplation. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, eh, eh, uh, Oh, well, I can't point there. <laughs> there is an orange progress bar. Uh, and the progress bar can be followed to, at any time, see where we are in the lecture. So uh, it has small milestones in there that indicate each lecture. And we are starting at the very bottom left uh, right now, where we are in the first chapter. So you can check at any time where we are. And now to a short disclaimer, because I find it important to point out uh, that I'm not not a monk or official meditation teacher or anything. I am doing this out of passion. I'm not following any major tradition or anything. I fully rely and only rely 
on the suttas, on the Buddha suttas, that he has been spoken uh, the very early texts. And you have to verify what I say for yourself, like the Buddha encouraged us to do. It's not about just believing me. It's not just about faith. There is faith in, in all of this, but it has to be confirmed faith at some point. You have to test it for yourself if you want to profit from all of that. And I point out many contradictions from popular traditions with the Buddha's lectures. So be prepared for that. It can be very disagreeable at times because many of the modern traditions are very much in contradiction with uh, what the Buddha actually taught. And there are so many hundreds and thousands of, of lectures that sometimes contradict with uh, certain popular modern teachings that I kind of have to point it out. And then you can decide for yourself what you want to believe. And I am aware that uh, the presented information sometimes goes against the Abhidhamma, the Visuddhimagga and many modern uh, traditions. It is intentional. And I limit myself really to the original teachings. Newer or other practices can totally have merit, but I simply want to actually refresh what the Buddha actually taught. This is my goal with this lecture. And if you want that, by all means, keep listening. <laughs> if you don't want that, then do something, do something else with your time, which is also perfectly fine. And also try to do the inside experiments that I suggest at your own risk. Um, if you are not prepared and, and still do them, then they can have some uh, side effects. And it's always a good idea to seek skillful teachers before attempting such a task and before getting serious. And now to some last remarks. Some peculiarities. Dhamma means going against the grain of the world, and it's often initially uncomfortable. This is very important to keep in mind. Some things, I will say, are disagreeable. They are uncomfortable, but that does not mean that they are not true. This is also true for seasoned practitioners. If you see yourself challenged in your views, that is a good sign for some remaining work, especially with you where, when you disagree with the Buddha. Because many people before us have kind of verified that what the Buddha taught works. And uh, also, I record each of the approximately 60-minute <laughs> lectures in one go without editing. So that's uh, 777 slides in total. So bear with me when there are hopefully some small mistakes. And the slides can seem a bit crowded at times, but I also hand them out as a script for others to read from, from time to time. So uh, it's a good idea to... <laughs> well. Um, write more text on them because it's easier to understand them then. And also a very important remark, feel free to give me feedback and comments below because uh, after the very last lecture I will answer the most frequent questions in another video or two videos. So feel free to comment below and uh, I will uh, make a video about that in the end where I will answer, answer the most frequent questions. And the more general your question is, the more people it concerns, the more likely is it uh, that I answer it. But I don't know how many <laughs> questions there will be but we will see i will make a video about it uh, in the end nonetheless this is also a slide that you will repeatedly see and this is a, a shout out please leave me questions for a q a comment them below or let me know in any other way and now to the final slide here are some links uh, if you want to support me or want to join the the dhamma hub discord server feel free to scan any of the qr codes i will move out of the way <laughs> so that you can actually scan them so if you want to buy my books, feel free to do so or support me on Patreon. If you want to join the Dhamma Hub, by all means do so. And there are also hard copies available. Anyway, this is it for the first lecture. I'm very happy if you have made it till the end. Uh, every week from now on, there will be a new lecture. And if you want to stay with me till the end or want to recommend the lecture to anyone else, I would be very happy about that. But until then, I wish you a very pleasant day and goodbye. And I hope that you profit from the presented knowledge in here. Have a nice day.